start transmission <coughs> let's check transmission or our websites web pages let me reload okay let me see let me see if the stream has started if you are already listening let me know via chat in the bxp room both on freenode and matrix network i'm uh, i'm waiting uh, uh, your your okay on, on chats let me see we are live bandali oh thank you bandali Bandali is on our IRC. <coughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And so there we go. Uh, what's up, folks? Everything in Uma Nice. Blau here. And as you can see, this is a uh, Monday's Live, a little bit different from the others. To start with, we are speaking in English or trying to speak in something similar to English, which is not very <coughs> easy for me, but no problem because we are among friends and everything is possible with a little help from our friends. Uh, second, what makes this live really special is our guest today, Richard Stallman, who generously accepted the invitation to chat with us and all the XP community today. Um, but before we talk about our guest, I'd like to thank Kretil for the initiative. Uh, he is really the, the guilt one for this live. Oliva for making the bridge for us. Uh, Amin, Banda Amin Bandali for the technical support so that this live streaming could happen. And of course, to all our team that worked very hard organizing the, this event. Finally, uh, unlike your, un, our usual lives, usual lives, the questions were sent in advance and we drafted the, the topics of our conversation based on them, based on, our, uh, on your questions, uh, questions of our community. But you guys and girls, <coughs> you still can ask questions via IRC or the Matrix Network. Uh, we'll write them down, and if there's time, Richard will be able to decide if and which ones uh, he wants to answer. Well, well uh, without further uh, ado, Richard, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation. We are very excited about your presence here, and... It's a tradition here in Monday's Lives that all participants and guests give a brief greeting or make a short introduction on the topic of the night or about themselves before the conversation actually begins. So, uh, to make that short today, uh, this night, this time, uh, I'll ask to Kretil and Oliva uh, to, to make a to say a few words to introduce you to our community. Uh, Kretil, thank you again, and please go ahead. Good evening, Blau. Thank you again for the opportunity. Good evening, Igor, Alex, Luca, and Richard, and everybody. Richard Stallman, the creator of Free Software Movement, a new project and the Free Software Foundation, and still our cornerstone. Today, I would <coughs> like to start telling you a story. Someday, at a barbecue, I invited Richard to play football, Totó, Pebolin, in Portuguese, and he answered me, I don't like competition. Despite his authority, I disagreed. I said, the free software model competes to the non-free software model. He told me, no, it's not a competition. They want to fuck us. So this is a war. I don't like competition, but I like war. Welcome, 
our free software warrior? What I probably said was, I don't understand competition, but I understand war. If you don't have to fight someone, why fight? It makes no sense to me. I'd rather not engage in something that feels like a fight with somebody who's not an enemy. So this is why I don't understand competition in any deep sense. Well, I know something about it, of course. I live in the world. I see competition going on. It doesn't make emotional sense to me. I understand. Well, what we are doing to proprietary software is first step, escape from it. Second step, get rid of it. Ok, Oliva. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to be here to have Richard tonight. Uh, Richard has been uh, an inspiration to me for over 25 years since I met him face to face. Um, uh, I think introducing him is really not necessary. His, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I give you Richard Stallman. <laughs> <laughs> great, great, Oliver. Uh, well, Richard, for a start, we we'll, uh, make yourself at home. A casa é sua, como, uh, how, uh, how we say here. Uh, in fact, we don't usually do interviews here on our live streamings. Uh, we prefer see them as bate papos, uh, chats with friends, guests, our, our community on chat. So if you have something to say before the questions uh, we receive it, uh, there are no more than a kind of uh, uh, guide for us, guideline. Please go ahead, be at easy, be at home. Oh, please tell me, is there a time when, is there an ending time, or are we going to go on for as long as we feel like? Which way is it? Juca, please. Uh, uh, to me, the, the sound uh, faded a little. I, I, I could understand it, the final of your, your, your saying. I'm asking whether we are going until a particular time or whether we will continue ah. as long as we wish. This lives uh, usually go to go for one and a half and two hours. Okay, now I know. Thanks. <clears throat> so if you, if you want more, no problem. For no that. problem. I'll either. probably want to, I'll be yearning to go back to answering my email, okay. which I have too much of. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we can send you questions by email. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first the first question we received here was, uh, 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 by the way, was uh, Igor here that made this question? Uh, have you ever tried feijoada or caipirinha? I've tried feijoada. It's not one of my favorite dishes. Uh, caipirinha, no because general, I mostly do not take alcohol with the exception of wines if I like the taste and I don't have much of that. Uh, I do not want to be under the influence of alcohol ever. Right. Uh, uh, this, this and I don't like the taste of any form of alcohol except some wines. And about to basically, this... those drinks taste like alcohol except for beer, which tastes sort of bitter and unpleasant. So, really, no thanks. <laughs> and what about this, this, uh, this drinking? New. I can't tell what it is. GNU. Oh. <laughs> GNU Linux. Uh, this is oil, oh, well. 
olive oil, uh, 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 an ol olive oil bottle, and I made this this label uh, with uh, similar to 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 uh, some some alcohol, uh, but that's my favorite drinking. Gnu. Well, I often have olive oil, but not. I don't generally drink it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you tell us about uh, the very beginning of Free Software Movement and the uh, new project, uh, uh, especially uh, a little before the the uh, uh, when when. Uh, uh, before the, the free software movement, before when uh, uh, when you're uh, with your 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 community of hackers uh, in universities, what can you tell us about that time? M uh, to seem uh, uh, to me, uh, that time seems to be very cool. I have m I have. M it was. Uh, let me let me start, please. Okay. Because I'm going to have a lot to. To, a lot of questions to answer. Yeah. So try to let me be efficient and let, make this whole thing efficient. You'd like to know about that time before I started the GNU project. Yeah. Uh, in the 1970s, I was part of a community of hackers that shared software. Now, the software was developed mainly by us hackers with occasional other contributors. And it included various universities, sometimes companies as well. The lab where I worked was in some sense the in some sense the deepest part of it because we used the incompatible time sharing system or ITS, which was written entirely by hackers. Uh, now the Stanford AI lab started with a version of uh, Digital's PDP-10 time-sharing system back when that was, uh, as far as I know, legally not copyrighted, even then they had the source code, uh, and they started making lots of changes to that, whereas we developed one uh, from zero using some of the software that had been used on the PDP-6 before time sharing. So we were in a world of free software. And we all shared the software whenever, you know, if somebody wanted a copy of a program you were working on, you would say, here it is. That was our way of life. It was shocking to do anything else. And at the, at the beginning of my time in it, which was in 1971, this was not totally unusual. There were, you know, a lot of computers came with an operating system in source code with nothing intent, intending to stop people from redistributing it. Uh, in our part of the world, there wasn't much non-free software. Although during the 1970s, that changed. And non-free software started encroaching and then it spread all around and then in mo by the end of the 70s in most places there was no free software anymore non-free software had become the norm and the occasionally uh circumstances made the difference visible to me for instance around 1981 or so uh, I suggested to somebody who was uh, in charge of computer facilities at Harvard because they were running very strict security on these computers. I said, well, how about if you let each uh, floor of a living unit of one of the houses have its own computer and have a few students from that floor be the system administrators and that way they could learn to be good system administrators and at the same time instead of iron discipline and rule and subjection 
they could teach the people on their floor who knew each other anyway to get along in the computer the way they got along in physical space. That is, as as neighbors rather than uh, people suspicious of and hating everyone else. The answer I got surprised me. We have proprietary software on these computers, and we've promised not to let any student get at a copy of it. Before that, I didn't realize that non-free software was one of the drivers of police state time sharing. See, it turns out that if you have a time shared computer with various users, the only way to maintain security for any users against the other users is to treat them all like subjects of a police state. I, I, I had seen the document that they made all students agree to, which basically said, if we think that you're trying to break any of these rules, that's breaking the rule and you will be kicked off the computer. What repression? And, uh, and that was a cause that we at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab were very up in arms against. In our time sharing system, the internet, the incompatible time sharing system, we didn't implement security. We didn't want any sort of security features because the hack, the older hackers had realized at the beginning, if they implemented some sort of security, the administrators would use it to control everybody. But the administrators were not capable of implementing the security. So the hackers decided we won't give them these systems to control us with. We won't let them tell who's doing what. We won't put, write anything to keep track of who's doing what. And uh, that's, that was effective, quite effective during the 70s. But uh, in any case, this connected in my mind non-free software, which I was coming to recognize as oppressive, with uh, passwords and file permissions, which I already thought of as repressive, along with basically everybody there. So uh, that world continued you know, to some extent, until the PDP-10 died. And uh, the PDP-10 died and wasn't repaired because the community had already died. And that's because they had gone to work for one of the two competing Lisp machine companies. There was LMI and there was Symbolics. And uh, only two of us remained at the MIT AI lab, which meant that the hacker community was basically dead. And then one of them, uh, he was working part-time for MIT and part-time for LMI. And, there were so, and then somebody from Symbolics pointed out there was an MIT rule saying he couldn't do that. So he had to leave. And I was the last hacker at the AI lab. And uh, it was, uh, rather than take up a lot of time with this, because you can read about this in the last chapter of the book, Hackers, by Steve Levy, the point is that the hacker community had died. The free software that we had used was all dead because it was written for a particular computer, and that was dead. And everything... Everything was gone. So what could I do? I had, to st I had to start another community. And that's what I did with the GNU project. I said, let's make another world of free software and invite a lot more people into it. And let's try to make a community in which we can do everything using 
free software and we never have to run a non-free non program. I had a, a quick follow-up question, uh, which was actually about the Stephen Levy's book. I would ask you if you if you agree with the with the depiction of the history that is in the book, if it is uh, accurate. Well, what's in the last chapter was accurate. However, the first section of the book was about things at the MIT AI lab before I was there. Uh, so. You know, as far as I know, it's accurate, but I couldn't tell for the most part. I learned things from that, too. And the other two major sections were about other communities, which I didn't know a lot about. Okay, you had a more question. And most of them were, work, and most of them were doing non-free software. Mm -hmm. Like the games. The games that were just covered in the third of the three main sections of that book were non-free. And not only that, they ran on microcomputers and I never worked with microcomputers. In my home computer was a PDP 10. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't belong to me, but it, but as one of the system hackers, it might as well have been my computer. Although whatever I implemented on it was generally for, the use of people at the lab. Uh, okay, uh, anyone? Okay, let's let's go ahead. Uh, other question is why and how to encourage people to fight for their for their freedoms. Uh, In general, well, sorry. I don't know how to explain to you why freedom is important. Uh, freedom is so fundamental that either you get it or you don't. I've seen people argue for freedom based on other values. But for me, those other values are less important. You know, you some people argue that freedom leads to more progress. Well, freedom's more important than progress. And uh, does it, you know, all the other things that you can try to argue for something based on are less crucial than freedom. But we can look around today and see the reason why software must be free and that is non-free software is generally malware malware means software designed to mistreat the user mostly when people talk about that they presume that the malware is something that wasn't supposed to be in the computer at all and was put in by somebody who wasn't supposed to have anything to do with that computer but that's closing your eyes to the most common malware, which is uh, proprietary software developed by companies that make operating systems or apps. And it's software that it was intended to, it was intended to be in the computer, but it was also designed to mistreat the user. You know, Microsoft Windows is malware. Mac OS is malware. Android is malware. Parts of Android are free software, but there are many non-free parts, and some of them are malware. And uh, iOS, Apple's uh, mobile operating system for the iMonsters, that's malware. Uh, and Chromos is malware, because uh, Chrome is malware. You've got to expect this. Ex experimental surveys have found that most apps available for mobile devices are malware. Why is this? Well, if a company controls what's in the program, that company has ways to benefit by mistreating users. 
And since it controls the code of the program, no one can stop it. There, there are no checks on what the company can get away with, except if it does something so horrible that users will stop using it. But part of, one of the malicious functionalities that they tend to put in is various things to make it hard for users to move away or stop using it. And so they do that, and when the users see that they have become addicted and screwed, at that point it's hard for them to do anything about it. So if you don't want the software to mistreat you, you better make sure that the users control it. And the way to do that is with free software. Absolutely. Uh, you mean uh, freedom of choice is less important uh, than freedom itself? Absolutely. Choosing between a limited set of options is a very small example of freedom. Yes, it is an example of freedom, but it's not much. So if you have a choice, say, between Windows and Mac OS, well, how much freedom is that? That's me. That means you can choose your master. But freedom means not having a master. Now, people who are not programmers sometimes ask, why does this matter to a, a non-programmer? Well, it's true. If you're not a programmer, you're not going to change the code of the programs you're running yourself. But if the program is free and users are free to change it, there will be various groups of users working on versions that are changed in this way or that. And you and other users can get together with those groups and say to them, you know, could you add the feature to do this? Could you change that feature a little? So, because I find it annoying the way it works. And uh, you can do that. You, if you and a few programmers, say you and a few friends and a few programmers decide to, this group can make a modified version to do whatever it is those people want, and uh, then you get what you want. You can't do that with a non-free program because you and those other people, you can't get the source code. You're not allowed to make, let alone release, a modified version. With free software, you can. Uh, related to this, uh, let me let me f uh, find here. Uh, okay, uh, we have another question about uh, about the browser-based software. Uh, software as a, as a substitute of service. Uh, to me, see. Well, actually, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's service as a uh, software yeah. substitute is sure. what you're talking about. But that's actually different. Yeah. That's a different thing. Service as a software substitute means you have some computing you want to do, but instead of doing it on your own computer, you send it to some server where software that you never get runs and does that computing job and shows you the result. Yep. And the problem, the moral problem with that is that you don't get to control the software that does your computing. You don't even have it on your own computer. Uh, so that's, that's equivalent of using a non-free program. In other words, it might look like a solution, especially if you realize, well, this way I avoid having a non-free program on my computer. And yeah, the way I used to describe the problem uh, 20 years ago, well, it sounded like that that's a solution. You avoid having a non-free program on your computer, but it doesn't give you control over the computing that's done. Because the program doing this computing is running in a server 
and you can't touch it there. But browser-based software is a different problem. It means that you run a program that was sent straight to your browser from someone else's server. So you still depend on that server. It controls what's going to run in your machine. Now, if the software is free, there are some ways, although a bit inconvenient, to come up with changes, patches to put into that program when it gets into your machine. Uh, there is a thing to do this. I've never used it. It's just not an easy thing to do. It's not easy for the community to maintain and release modified versions that way. Now, if the server does nothing, absolutely nothing, except send that program to your browser when you want that program, well, you could make a difference and you make a mod, suppose it's free software and you download the source and you make a modified version, you can put that on a different server and say, if you want to run my version, come to my server and others could do likewise. This could be okay. You could install it. You could make your own computer, even your own laptop, be a, a server for itself and install the version you like and run that then it becomes architecturally complicated and twisted, but maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, especially once it's, if you don't notice it once it's set up, then okay, fine. Uh, but when that is, that program is, is uh, inherently tied to using a particular service, then it's just no good. That software has got to be something that's released and so that you can install the version you like. Basically, JavaScript, as uh, Alex put it, turns the web into an app store, except in some ways it's the worst of all the app stores. So that's not a solution either. People who like that like it for convenience. You don't have to install anything. You don't need to think about that. Well, yeah, I see the point. But convenience must not be the primary value. Because if it is, you will be at the mercy of companies that know how to make things very convenient. And we know that uh, the company that is highly reputed for making things convenient is also uh, highly tyrannical, both for itself, for its own commercial benefit, and for various tyrannical governments. And that company, by the way, is Apple. <laughs> uh, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, uh, what more? Gafan. Well, they're different. They're different. They're different. Oh. They do different things. Yep. They do different things. Uh, I condemn all of them but for different reasons. Okay. Hey, that leads us to another question here about a problem uh, we are facing here in Brazil, uh, that is the adoption of non-free non software in public education. Uh, what, and the question is, What's the best way for the free software movement to react against big tech's vendor lock-in strategies over schools and government institutions? As far as I can tell, well, first of all, you've got to distinguish between government institutions and schools, even though the public schools are government institutions. Yeah. They're not, they do something very different. See, most government institutions 
what most government agencies run a lot of software internally. And if the government is using non-free software, that is a very bad thing for the country. It means that the proprietary software's developer has power over the country. The crucial reason for the state to move to free software is the digital sovereignty of the country. The, the state must have control over all the software that does the state's computing. Rather than letting some private interest have control over the state's computing. However, when the public institution, what the we governance agency deals with the public, that raises a different issue. It must not make the public run any non-free software. If it does, to, to make people run non-free software is directly to oppress them. Now, the schools are a big example of this because all they make the students run the non-free software. If the school administration were running the non-free software, that would be comparable to most government agencies. It would be a violation of the country's digital sovereignty, but it would not directly oppress masses of people. When the schools make their students run non-free software, that oppresses every student. How do you fight back against this? I can't see any way except the methods that people use against other kinds of oppression, uh, which are often difficult. Uh, basically, individual activists can start the struggle by refusing, by saying, I won't run that. So give me another way I can do this. P come up with a way that I can go do my classes without using any of that stuff. Now, in GNU.org slash education, Unfortunately, I don't remember the whole URL, but you will find uh, the article written by a Polish graduate student about how he finished his academic year rejecting every non-free program that his teachers tried to make him run. And he didn't have one simple method to do it either. He was flexible and clever. He didn't give up. He kept looking for another way. And in all of these different cases with different teachers, he found a way that the teacher would eventually accept so that he could do his work. So, you know, if you are just persistent and firm, you can often succeed. And it's very important to do so. But to change the schools themselves, we need larger groups of people in one place. We need enough people to go to the school and say, this is unacceptable. Don't you dare make a Google account for our children. Don't you dare make a Microsoft account. Don't you dare make an Apple account. Don't you dare make a Canvas account, you know, whatever kind of account it might be, don't do it. That's letting a company spy on our children and it doesn't matter what your contract with them says because we don't trust them. We don't believe them. I, I, I had an occasion on my own university course where I was, I, I supposedly had to use a non-free software for an assignment. And the way that I solved the problem, at least for me, was that, well, after talking to the professor and he kind of refused my propositions of using something else, uh, in the end, I simply did not do the assignment, get a zero grade in that specific assignment, but then I was good enough in the other assignments in order to pass. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, took an online course about copyright and uh, when he saw that the course required him to use non-free programs he wouldn't use them and so he failed the course 
he had the courage to say, well, I'll fail this course rather than go along with these requirements. I wish he had published an article about this in a very visible place because he uh, he would have taught people something. Kritchell? Well, yes, here we have a, another problem because we need to show the people, not only the students, but the teachers too, because many, very many teachers don't, uh, didn't know, don't understand. And thinking that Google accounts for free, it's a good. So yeah, well, yeah, a lot of people hard. have been confused. Uh, they think that if you get something gratis, that that means everything is fine. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of people are aware that what Google does is spy on people. So I don't know, maybe in Brazil, a lot of people haven't got that message yet. In the US, people who have some idea of things are getting that message. And people, uh, you know, the examples of what's going on in China, uh, you know, these and condemnation of Amazon for spying on people. These, uh, these are starting to spread that message. The part that is not spreading very much yet is how do you make software not spy on you? The answer is choose free software only. That will give the community the chance to make sure it doesn't spy on you. But we have to realize that that only works for the software that runs in your computer. But there are other systems that spy on people, uh, which don't do it by running in your computer. So there are systems you need to talk with, and they can collect data about you, and that's spying on you. They have to be designed to let you be anonymous. And that has to be a law. The law should say that uh, you need to, uh, that systems must be designed not to collect any data about persons unless it is impossible to do anything like that job without that data. Uh, in in various cities, I've come across systems where to pay to park the car, you have to enter the car's license plate in a digital system, a computer. Now, uh, whether you uh, pay properly or not, either way, that system knows where you parked. It's a mass surveillance system. That should be illegal because we do know of ways to charge for parking without uh, recording the identity of each car that parks. Uh, they may be a little less efficient. Well, to hell with efficiency. That's a little bit more efficiency should, in, in terms of how much work it is to collect the money, uh, is not an excuse to track everyone. Unless we take that very strict interpretation of necessary, we will find constant efforts to justify surveillance of everyone. There's one case uh, that concerns me here in Brazil. I heard that there's a proposition uh, of a, a new law uh, to enable uh, or even to require that uh, the public, uh, the 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 roads that connect cities uh, have a system for uh, charging the the fees to use the roads uh, automatically, and then people would have to sign up to those systems in order to travel in those uh, roads. And I'm concerned that it won't be possible to travel on the roads without using such a system. It's not clear how it would be implemented or whether it would be completely mandatory for everybody or not. But it concerns me that it probably something like that might happen. 
it concerns me too. In fact, they did something like that here in Massachusetts. You can't pay toll without doing so through methods that identify you. And that's that's a gratuitous problem. Anonymous toll collection is a problem that was solved decades ago by uh, David Chaum, who invented the blind signature. Uh, it wasn't adopted, but it's established technology, and now we have a convenient implementation called GNU Toller. So you could make a, a radio toll paying device, which would look just like the ones that people actually use that work by identifying themselves, except that it could it could be anonymous and uh, it would have toller tokens. And when you go past the radio system that collects toll, your computer, your little portable toll paying computer would send a toller token to the highway server and the highway server would know that toll was paid, but it wouldn't be able to tell who paid. Now, to prevent tracking everyone on the roads, it needs to be illegal to set up a device to record the license plate of every car that passes by, or to systematically record license plates of cars passing by. There should be an exception, namely a court should be allowed to order specific surveillance in a particular place for a certain period of time you know, treat it the same way as listening to phone calls. The state can get permission to listen to phone calls, but is not allowed to just do so on a blanket, massive basis. That's necessary for the sake of people's freedom. Anyway, GNU Toller already works. It's not specifically designed for paying toll. You'd have to put it into a, a suitable device. No, it's designed mainly for use over the internet for purchases. For purchases of access to something digital, it's obvious how that could work anonymously. The only thing that would need to know who you are is payment, and if payment doesn't need to identify you anymore, well, the rest can be anonymous, that's easy. Uh, for buying physical goods, there's the question of how to arrange to deliver it to you. But if there are stores with lots of boxes where things get delivered, you can choose one, you could buy a physical object, specify where it should be delivered, pay for it, get a receipt, a digital receipt, which is signed to validate it without knowing anything about who you are, and all the store knows is which box it's going to be delivered in. I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, since you, you were telling me something that I did not, didn't know about, uh, you're telling that there exists technology that is implemented as free software and that solves this kind of problem. And I suppose that Brazil is not the only country that has this kind of problem. It, might be interesting from a campaign's perspective uh, to try to map which are the countries that have uh, laws or proposals of new laws. It might be interesting. Country. I can't yeah. do it. I'm busy. You but know, if I'm, someone wants yeah, to yeah. do that, that would be good. By the way, for more information about GNU Taller, look at taller.net. Sure. T A L E R. That word was the name of a uh, German coin in the 1700s. And that's where the word dollar came from. Mm -hmm. and I was not specifically talking about you doing it, but actually the FSF yeah. as an organization. Well, sorry, the FSF hasn't got that much in the way of resources. It mm -hmm. can't just go out and do another thing. It mm -hmm. needs money to pay somebody to do another thing. 
Uh, and where does the money come from? It comes mainly from individuals. So you could join the Free Software Foundation as an associate a member. member. Oh, thank you. Well, that's where the money comes from. More associate members means the FSF can do more. Mm -hmm. um, I think... And so I, I'd like to ask those of you who are watching this conversation, sure. please join the Free Software Foundation. And you can also say that uh, uh, watching uh, this conversation with me is what m moved you to join. Okay. Uh, can we move on to another question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Another another subject, <laughs> I know this is the most important uh, subject uh, that we talk uh, uh, at, until now, but we have other questions, uh, uh, for example, uh, about open source. Um, Juca, uh, here with us, uh, made this question, to, uh, sent this question to us. Uh, Juca, do you mind to... to to, to explain the question to, to Stalin? Sure, sure. The question is simple, and you will recognize that sentence, Richard. Uh, why does open source misses the point of free software? Well, you have to recognize that the term open source was invented in 1998 as a, another way of talking about basically the same practice, but without uh, bringing up ethics. In other words, presenting it in purely practical terms. What were those people doing and why was the result useful? So they, they, did, they formulated a way of talking about the same community working on the same software, more or less the same software. And, but they did it without saying freedom without raising the issue of right versus wrong, only what works better or what, what doesn't work. Then they started an organization which wrote a definition of open source, and it was pretty close to equivalent to the definition of free software, but not exactly. Uh, and it was interpreted by different people. So the line ended up being drawn at a somewhat different place. So there are some programs that they judge to be open source, which we say are not free software. This is somewhat confusing. It's unfortunate. But the big difference is at the deepest level, the values. Because we say that a non-free program is an injustice. It's wrong to lead people to use a non-free program. It means that you're getting power over them or you're helping someone else get power over them. The open source people don't talk about this issue at all. Uh, so, and so therefore, I've refused... Oh. Ever since 1998, I've refused to promote open source. That's not how I describe what I do. But you have to realize that all of the free programs we work on w would fit the definition of open source. Sure. So at that level, free programs almost always are open source. And almost all open source programs are free, though I know of a few exceptions. Did, did you refuse open source since the very first moment or did it well, take the a first while moment understand? it took me about a day okay when eric raymond told me about their plan to use that term uh, i think he phoned me and he asked me if i would use the term and i said i'll have to think about it and by the next day i realized that it would be very unwise for me to promote the term open source it would be self-defeating because it would bury uh, even more the idea of freedom. 
Now, in English, the word free has the problem that people may think it means uh, gratis. But uh, you, what can you do? We don't have a better word. Uh, sometimes we say uh, libra, borrowing from French or Spanish, uh, to make the to make the distinction clearer. But in Portuguese, when you say livre, people won't think that that means uh, gratis. So sure. you have it completely clear. Just don't use the English word free. That's just that's borrowing a, an ambiguity that you don't need. Perfect. So. And, Go ahead. And, and Richard, how do you feel, or even better, how do you react when people nominate you as a open source father? <laughs> uh, you know, I used to have a clever response to that, but it's been so many years that uh, that I don't remember what it was. <laughs> uh. So, I just have a vague memory that I had a clever reply. Do you remember? Yeah. Tell me. I think, Tell us. Yes. It's about uh, uh, some sperm. <laughs> somebody, Stolen. Even uh, Only if somebody get your sperm. Oh, right. It was your conceived with stolen sperm without yeah. my knowledge or consent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Uh, well, but it's been a long time since anybody called me that. <laughs> uh, See, nowadays the fa nowadays the fashion is not to admit I did anything good for anyone. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, uh, still about open source. Uh, I have to confess, I'm really I'm, uh, I'm re uh, really uncomfortable with uh, the kernel I use I'm I, I, I'm not happy with a Linux kernel I use uh, Linux Libre thank you Oliva uh, <laughs> and we have a question here that reflects so, so sort of the my my um, my my, uh, uh, my my feelings about kernel Linux. Uh, do you think it's time for us to go and find another kernel or develop another kernel? I think that's a silly sort of question. Uh, please, no offense meant. Sure, sure. Uh, why should it be time to replace a free program? Uh, especially a very big free program, which is a tremendous amount of work. Okay. Which includes lots of device drivers. And how are you going to replace all of those? It's it's just, you know, too much. Fun. We tried developing a different kernel. Now it wasn't meant as a replacement for Linux. We started before Linux, but the problem we ran into was. We had chosen an advanced design using a microkernel and processes that would communicate. And it turned out to have a lot of problems, fundamental problems in that design that no one has a way to fix. And people don't use it. So, well, do you have some. I don't see a reason. Well, yes, in a way. Maybe we should have started developing a kernel uh, using the old-fashioned, obvious monolithic architecture. Who knows? Ultimately, though, it turned out that not to be a big problem in practice because we do have Linux. And Linux is free software, except that in the usual release, there are some firmware blobs, which are basically their binary code dressed up as a as a list of numbers so the purpose of linux libre is delete those then you get a free pr program now if the developers of linux were free software activists they would never have agreed to include those blobs in it that's too bad torvalds never was a supporter of the free software movement. 
what can you do? In fact, he was one of the people who had open source type ideas before the term open source was coined. You know, those ideas didn't begin in 1998. Lots of people sort of liked free software, but uh, found the idea of the free software movement <clears throat> to be too radical and simply never agreed with it. <clears throat> well, thank I you. Think we have yeah other uh, questions. Yeah, Igor. From the audience, including. Uh, Igor could read this, those questions uh, for us. Can you? Oh, you I see. There's a, there's some questions in my chat that I haven't seen. Yeah. Do you want me to start answering these? Okay. I've got. A, what do you think about the ethical hacking movement? Well, I have to explain that hacking meant playing around in clever funny ways they don't they didn't all have to be funny some of them were just impressive so in the 1970s when i said i was a hacker i meant the same thing that the other hackers meant uh enjoying a certain kind of playful cleverness now one of the air, one of the domains in which people practice this playful cleverness was getting through computer security. But remember, these were big computers that belonged to the university uh, in the 1960s. That's there were no personal computers. There were no microcomputers. If you were a student, you wanted to use a computer. It was a computer at a university. And the question is, did they turn it off at night? You know, if you could learn to get into the computer room and turn it on and manage to run it, you could use it at night when normally they weren't letting anyone use it. How stupid, what a stupid waste. If this machine gave basically 24 hours of computer time per day, what a shame if people could only use it for 14 hours of the day and eight and 10 hours of the day it was wasted and you had a project to do why not go in and turn it on at night and get some more work done and this was a computer that you were supposed to be using but not at night so but on the other hand uh breaking security could also be fun because it was clever but back then the hackers and were not and stealing money the they weren't was... doing breaking the security of bank computers or anything like that it was academic computers that they were trying to use <clears throat> but that was only one side of what people did with hacking you know uh at MIT, there were a bunch of programs known as display hacks, which was basically write a program to make some pretty thing appear on the display console. And some of them were beautiful and interesting. We appreciated them. You may have come across munching squares, which was one of the old display hacks from the 1960s. It can be fascinating trying different parameters to control what it will do. Playful cleverness can be in any area. There are composers who composed pieces that were hacks in some ways and that they were they demonstrated playful cleverness. Uh, there is a piece by Guillaume de Machaut who lived in the 1300s and he was the first star composer in Europe. Uh, this piece was a palindrome, is a palindrome. I mean, people still do sing it sometimes. So that was hacking. It was also good music. And 
Sometimes it's just for fun. Well, that's right. That's the point. Uh, it's being clever for the pleasure of being clever, but also sometimes for a practical use. Uh, for me, uh, a lot of the software I've written that people enjoy using, well, writing it was still hacking. I was still being playfully clever as I did it, although it was to address a practical job, not purely for amusement. Are you nowadays hacking? Not, not in much that? in software. Uh, problem is, I have, a, I have work to do, which takes up most of my day. And uh, I wish that were not so, but it's a responsibility, and I can't just throw it away. I, think I don't know who, I, will take, who could take it up. I In any case, I, I, this question is about, quote, ethical hacking. They got conf people got confused in the early 1980s, and they thought that hacking meant breaking security. And the people who do, quote, ethical hacking, unquote, means to them that they deal with the question of breaking security, but not with the goal of breaking security and causing harm to people. Uh, well, that what they're doing might be a good thing to do, but I don't call it hacking because for most of them it isn't. Uh, when I want to talk about breaking the security on a computer, I call it cracking, yeah. which is a term that I coined in the 1980s so that we could talk about that without calling it hacking. Please don't use the term hacking to refer to breaking security. In the AI lab, we never broke any security. We had a time-sharing system that didn't have security in the 1970s. So nobody ever broke the security. Great. If you don't make the security, you never need to break it. Uh, but we did plenty of hacking. It just wasn't cracking. So if other people call that hacking, please insist on calling it cracking when you talk about it. Uh, so I think I've answered that question, and then I, uh, I have just a quick comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, regarding the display hacks, uh, there is something that still happens nowadays, but started in the eighties. Unfortunately, it involves uh, uh, like a, a vast majority of those things are non-free, but some are free software. But there's a community of art artists that use computers to make art. Unfortunately, most of those are not sharing the source code under free terms, but uh, it happens throughout Europe, uh, around the world, where people make these fun graphical, um, visual, multimedia uh, pieces of art by running code, and it's called the demo scene. And it's really unfortunate, unfortunate that they don't share so much. of. There the needs to be a code. free demo movement. Yeah. That there's called, some people who adhere to these ideas and who participate. It would be good if they held yeah. free demo events where it is a rule that the that every program presented there or developed there or discussed there must be free. That because could be this, interesting once we get back to having uh, uh, in-person conferences, right? Well, even if it's a virtual conference, it could still have this rule. Yeah, sure, sure. Stop. So... You, yeah. You you talk about your work. So <clears throat> Oliva puts there in a the chat a question from audience. Maybe we have some billionaire there. Uh, the question is, what are the things the Free Software Foundation can do with more money? Or if Free Software Foundation gets one billion tomorrow, what is the most important? I don't have an answer ready. <clears throat> You're asking me to make a list of things and then compare, evaluate them all and compare. And sorry, I'm not ready to do that. I can think of some things that to do, but 
I'd have to, you know, to, to say what's the most important, I'd be in effect saying, I looked at the whole list and I haven't I, seen the whole list. I, I'm sorry, I think, I but think I can good, give you some. I think it's a good problem to deal with. Eh? So, uh, well, actually, I think Sam it's very unlikely we'll get a billion dollars. <laughs> but no, we did look at the question of what would we want to do if we had one, if we had could hire one more person, and we decided that the area would be uh, legal, things having to do with copyright and licenses. But it's not just legal. It's you know we would want to talk more about the importance of copyleft. We need to do more to promote copyleft. And if we got a billion dollars, I'm sure we would spend some of it promoting copyleft. I think it's a good opportunity to talk about the high priority projects list. Well, there's a, <clears throat> there has been a bit of confusion about the high priority projects list because currently it includes things that are not technical projects, which I think was a mistake. It should be technical projects only. That was the idea of it. Uh, but in any case, uh, it has a list of big projects and uh, I'd say it should be called the important long term projects list. The things that you could start working on now and over a period of years that could turn into an, a big advance for the free world. And uh, but, you know, you got to start, you got to figure you're going to be working on this for a long time. In the 80s, the FSF used to fund the, uh, the work of developers to actually write free code, but then it stopped it. Uh, it's not clear to me why did it stop funding? Oh, the well, for a while we didn't have enough money to do so, but also it's partly that uh, the advance of volunteers so numerous that we couldn't even keep track of them and that work that didn't make it easy to keep track of what they were doing was going so fast that we wouldn't be able to figure out what we should pay someone to do. You know, if we did that, by the time it was finished, there might be a, another one that was already more advanced. Yeah, we have a, a question related to this, uh, connecting to what we are talking about uh, as we grow older. Uh, we don't have much time, we have life commitments. So what advice would you give to new programmers, like young people with a lot of energy? Uh, they are willing to contribute to, to the free software movement. My advice basically to everyone is don't have children. <laughs> I'm very, the reasons are very somber ones. In a few decades, we're likely to have global disaster. No matter what country you're in, people there may be starving. They may be fighting over who's going to get some food. They may be fleeing from fires. People in Brazil, people in Amazonia may be fleeing from fires. There may not be a forest anymore. You know, uh, ecologists say that the Amazon forest is on the verge of turning into a savanna because it's drying out. I don't think humanity will be wiped out. Civilization might be. And of course, the end of civilization would mean the death of most people. So, if you have children, then A, they face a horrible future in a few decades. Why throw someone into that? Second, it means you're going to have to, instead of working on things that might help civilization continue, 
or defend freedom, prevent oppression of most people. You'll have to put all your efforts into making money, doing whatever rich people will pay you to do so as to get money to raise your children, which means you won't be doing something contributing to an important cause. And your life will be a terrible, desperate struggle to raise your children. And all, all you can avoid this. I made the right decision. I decided not to have children because I realized it would mess up my life. But at the time that I was just about to start the GNU project, uh, someone I adored asked me if I would please marry her and support her and our children. And I said, I can't do that. I have a revolution to run. Yes, but Alex Oliva, for example, create his daughter. Well, and then well he, he's a, he found another, a free software job. He creates what? I didn't hear one word. His daughter yeah. is like a, a well, new hacker. Well, you know, I saw us. Well, actually, I didn't know she was a hacker, but uh, I thought her, she was mainly interested in acting. But uh, in any case, well, I mean, you can do it. He found a free software job. There are some. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, really, why make more people? Well, the other thing is that the more people we create, the worse the disaster is going to be. Richard, I it? think I understand what you're saying, but on the other hand, uh, it seems to me that for many, many people, uh, having a kid uh, is part of what makes their life complete, and I don't want to blame them for that. Uh, I think it's part of it's one of the aspects of the human. You can help nature. raise, you can help take care of other people's children, or you could adopt a child. If you are desperate to raise a child, you can adopt a child. There are plenty of children who could use being adopted. Uh, you will still have to struggle to get money, and you may find yourself compelled to do work that you're ashamed of until eventually you forget to be ashamed of it anymore. But at least you won't be adding to the world's population and thus making the disaster bigger. I'm not trying to say that every child is a bad person. I'm not saying that. That's a different question. Yeah, but many people do things that it's not the best way to do for any reasons. Like yeah, me, well, I have two, two child, not child anymore, a, a son and a, a, and a daughter. So I'm not I'm trying to tell you to do something different in the past. Okay. <laughs> I'm making a suggestion to people now. Yeah, if you then, think about what will happen when global disaster continues getting worse for a couple of decades? You'll yeah. see that I think, I the, think there's a chance be, that... the world you'd be bringing those children in is likely to be very bad. And yes, we're trying to we're trying to limit the disaster. We must try to limit the disaster. That's very important. We don't know whether we will succeed, but even if we do. Things will get a lot worse. We know that. Whether the, whether they will get so much worse that they destroy civilization and wreck the world, uh, we don't know. We can try to stop that. But even if we stop that, things by 2050 will be much worse. So, okay. sorry, sorry. If, so if you don't have children, you will be avoiding part of the contribution to global heating.
It's not easy to live more cheaply, do make do with less. If we make do with fewer children, we don't need to uh, cut down as much indivi each person individually. It's easier to succeed. These are, are compelling. There's no way to avoid them, even though we don't know what the future will be like. Yeah, Richard, so, do, uh, uh, I, 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 let, let me just say one thing. Uh, uh, you, you have freedom of speech, but on the other hand, I believe that this kind of statements is very controversial and there's a chance it may jeopardize your free software activism. That may be so, but this is an even more important cause. Uh, if you, the conclusions may be distasteful. But it's something that people are starting to get used to. This is no longer such a shocking and controversial thing, uh, at least in the US, in, in Britain and some other countries. People are starting to get used to the idea that it may be better not to have children. And I hope people will think about this, but we could return to other topics. No, we will be Richard, uh, do you believe in hope? Do you have in hope? Hope in future? Hope? Uh, uh, I don't something? understand. Believe in? I don't know what it okay. means to believe in hope. Okay. I sometimes feel hope of certain things. Sure. Do you have any? And hopes? I sometimes feel despair. Ah, okay. I have felt both of those emotions during my life. And I tend to be rather empirical about those things. Sure. If I have, if I, my experience is I'm usually successful at doing something, I expect I'll probably succeed when I do that kind of thing. And if I've generally been a failure, it's a certain kind of thing. I expect I'll fail when I try to do that sort of thing. Okay. But I'm not going to believe in hope or Believe or believe in despair as if it were a matter of faith. Sure. I don't have faith as a general matter. I can have a certain amount of faith in a person to do a certain sort of thing. But that again is an empirical matter. I you have hope, hope on the on the Biden administration. Uh, I have some hope. It has run into a roadblock, but there is no obvious way to get across. And everything may be ruined by that. Uh, that roadblock has a name. Uh, his name is Manchin, a senator who is a Democrat but refuses to vote to eliminate the filibuster. And the filibuster is a Senate rule that gives the Republicans the opportunity to block almost everything. And uh, this includes blocking efforts to stop Republicans from stealing the next election. And it looks pretty bad unless somehow this is overcome. And nobody has a clear plan that seems likely to succeed. Now, something may succeed. There are ways that perhaps it could happen. You know, if it is possible to put enough political pressure on that senator, maybe it can succeed. But, uh, you know, it's hard to tell what would constitute enough pr pressure to succeed in convincing somebody to do something. Uh, if you allow me, just uh, change a bit of a subject for a personal uh, question I have, uh, Richard. Uh, it's about, uh, I'm a software engineer, been uh, doing that for many years now. And one thing I noticed uh, recently is that software became more complex, right? So we now develop software that uh, very frequently depends on libraries, depends on of other pieces of software, because before you would have your 
uh, thing. It was easier to just own that and share that. And now, because well, I don't see why using libraries necessarily alters that. Yeah, it's because true. you may use that. more libraries. Because if you abstract that part of the thing, you focus on your main thing and use that library. Not necessarily that library is free. Well, so you better, it should know. Well, now we see your problem. Mm -hmm. You're using non-free software. You shouldn't use non-free libraries because, well, let's assume your program is free. You haven't said, but supposing it yeah. is, mm -hmm. what use is it if it depends on a non-free library? In the free world, we can't use it. It won't work because we don't have that library. That library is morally off limits. So in order for a program to be a contribution to the free world, it has to run in the free world, which means it must, it, when you develop it, you must consider that library to be forbidden, forbidden by the need to respect the user's freedom. If your program is free, but depends on a non-free library, then it's leading users to install that non-free library, pressuring them to do so. And they may not have the moral fiber to refuse. So the point is, don't, don't add to the pressure on them. What is our duty if we develop a program? It is help people reject non-free software don't, rather than pushing them to use non-free software. So you re we have to treat non-free programs as non-existent. They shouldn't be in our computers. They shouldn't be in the computers of the users of what we develop. And we should be developing for that target, for the world in which that non-free library is forgotten. Um, right. There is an issue affecting free software, uh, and in in that a number of free software development environments encourage users to use repositories that are that hold free software, but that are centralized and that are like third-party infrastructure that you're supposed to rely on for your program to build and to run. And, uh, an example is the repository of JavaScript programs. Uh, another is, is for Rust, I, I believe, has something like that. I think this uh, uh, dependency on a specific set of repositories uh, amounts to a risk for for free software don't you I agree think that you're mixing up two different issues i don't see i'm not sure what it means depend on a specific repository are there is it that there are no mirrors or is it that the policies of that repository then are imposed effectively imposed on the whole community i mean these are two different issues uh there various languages have repositories of programs in that language that you might use as libraries. And uh, I don't see anything bad in general with that idea. But in fact, those repositories have non-free programs in them. And when you look for a program to do X, Y, Z, you're likely to come across one that isn't free and you're not and you wouldn't necessarily know unless you're checking carefully. Well, that's really bad. That's a problem I think we need to do something about. Uh, it takes some work. You know, people will have to write a way of setting up another repository and putting only the free programs in it or perhaps a way of filtering that repository so you can find only the free programs. This is the kind of thing that needs to be done. And maybe this is something that the FSF, if it got some extra money, could hire people to do. 
Here's a question. Is there a reason to use GNU Tyler over cryptocurrencies? Well, uh, there's, there are many differences. Cryptocurrencies are mainly useful as vehicles for speculation. Tyler isn't a currency. The payments are denominated in your national currency. It's only a way of paying. And in addition, although the payer is anonymous, the payee is identified, meaning that GNU Tyler is not a way to evade taxes. And this is very important because tax evasion by rich people uh, impoverishes governments so that they can't do the job, which is helping the citizens. Uh, there's a question, what is the plan for GPLv4? Uh, well, there isn't one. Uh, uh, I saw something a few months ago that seemed like it might be a reason perhaps to make a GPL v4. Uh, I filed it away and I don't actually remember what it was. It wasn't urgent. Uh, Richard. I have a chance to have a look at the Rust language and how it's like being the what writing language? Lately. What language? Rust. Rust. Oh no, I've never looked at Rust. Uh, I know that there is a screw. Apparently, there seems to be a screw with the trademark license, and uh, it might be difficult. Right. People are getting excited you, you, with that. By basically, placing C. Well, I don't care. Uh, maybe it, I, I don't have to have an opinion technically about that language. I've heard that it is not stable. That they're intentionally making big changes in the language from time to time. And it doesn't sound like it's a good idea to write your code in a language that isn't stable. Someday, maybe it'll be stable and that problem will go away. Uh, but there is a problem uh, that basically you're not allowed to distribute it and call it Rust unless you keep updating the version you're distributing, uh, and that is a pain in the neck. Uh, so we might be better off if we uh, renamed it to something like uh, Crust or... <laughs> uh, just so that we wouldn't need to use their trademark. Let me take this opportunity uh, about uh, once you mentioned that it's uh, not ideal to contribute to something that is constantly changing. Contribute uh, to? No, I didn't say that. Contributing oh, that is not stable. To, no, 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 no. That's no, cool. you got it wrong. Okay. That's not what I said. I said it might not be a good idea to use a language which is not stable to write your program because okay. that means your code will break when they change the language. Okay, and uh, this if is five, years, five years from now, if they decide they're finished changing it, that won't be a problem anymore. Sure. Uh, yeah, understood. Uh, this still gives me the opportunity to 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 talk about. Um, the way that applications are done with web browsers and JavaScript is uh, giving the developers of such systems that are hosted online, hosted on the web, uh, this flexibility of changing their interfaces all the time. And that's unfortunate because it's make, it makes it harder and harder to, to, to customize such programs because things keep changing. And I often say that there's code and there's data, and we should be focused on using the internet to exchange information, to exchange data, while we should have more stable APIs for the programs, for, for the code. I agree. I ourselves. agree totally. And this is one of the bad things about sending JavaScript to the user's browser. Uh, the program should be released separately and ideally, uh, the program should be more general 
and the website should use general facilities rather than sending you its own special purpose program. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for websites to look super fancy and slick. Uh, that's not needed for them to do the useful jobs. And if somebody wants you to see, uh, you know, wants to release a program that will do something interesting and wants you to see it, well, releasing it through a browser is not a good way to do that. I believe that uh, the architecture of the web is something that makes it much more difficult for us to fight non-free software uh, because um, in the past, when we were fighting uh, non-free programs, uh, desktop, uh, local uh, programs that we run on our computers, uh, we would uh, implement an alternative free software that implements the same file format. And file formats are much more stable than protocols over the web. So that's something much more challenging, right? I agree. But I refuse to use most of those online disk services. That's what I call them. Instead of calling them services, I call them disk services because they mistreat their users in many ways. It gets to the point where with Facebook, I say, uh, people don't use Facebook. Facebook uses people. And I urge people to yeah. refuse to be used by Facebook. Don't be a used of Facebook. Don't be a Zucker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got one in the chat I, I'd like to read out. Uh, just should uh, software and hardware products they are completely free, uh, benefit from different tax regimes, like paying less taxes as an incentive for businesses to adopt that. I don't know whether that makes sense. It's very vague. And it, uh, I don't, you know. It's like if a company uh, is fully uh, uh, like adopting uh, free software, if they should benefit from some tax I don't know. I don't know. What does it mean for a business to adopt free software? Are we talking about the software that the business re releases or, or distributes to clients? Are we talking about the platforms that these programs run on? Like, you know, if a program develops software to that can run on GNU slash Linux using a free distro or not? Uh, are we talking about the software that the business uses internally? They talk about services and hardware as well, hardware products, like you have uh, open hardware well, initiatives. I don't want to use the word open in this context. Uh, and it's, and I think it isn't meaningful to describe a particular hardware product as free or open. I think that those are, it's confused. Basically, what you have to talk about is a design. It's clear and meaningful to judge whether a given design, hardware design, is free or not. For instance, you could look at the design for a circuit board, and you can tell, is that design released as free or not? But then, suppose it is. Well, the circuit board would have chips put into it, and each chip has a design, and that might be free or not. And those are independent questions, the chip's design and the circuit board's design. So suppose we look at this piece of hardware. We could say, we could imagine asking, is this hardware, this hardware object free? Or others might say, is it open? And there, there's no answer because uh, there are different levels of design in the same hardware product, and each one of them is a separate question. By asking instead for each design whether it's free, we can have a clear answer. We can actually answer in ways that describe the situation clearly. So, uh, we need to be more precise when we're talking about hardware. With software, well, there are 
yeah, you see there's a circuit board and there are a lot of chips in it. And each of those chips, well, probably has a non-free design, but it's a different question for each chip. <laughs> in the 80s, it was simpler because most of these chips are standardized. They're yeah. manufactured to follow a very specific characteristic that is documented. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, Nowadays, I it's much harder because there's miniaturization and there's much more complexity on single chips. And yeah. then much more often, we, we don't know anybody, uh, anything about the internal workings of these chips nowadays. Right. So the point is, uh, maybe there should be laws to encourage uh, hardware designs to be free, programs to be free. And I wouldn't limit this to tax incentives. I'm not sure that that fits. I think that somebody can't pick the solution first because maybe it looked like it would be an easier solution to adopt, but I don't know if it fits. I would suggest that important online services should be required to specify an API, publish it, and only change it under limited circumstances so people can make their software and make their free software talk to that service. But in addition, their terms and conditions should be decided democratically by law, not uh, in the hands of the companies to impose on people. These regulate the lives of people. The people must decide what the regulations can be. We must not allow a uh, service or disservice like uh, Facebook or uh, Google Maps or whatever it might be to be treated like whether you're allowed to visit that company's uh, lounge. That it has to be decided democratically what the rules are for people using that kind of thing. Another question? What? Another question. What, what do you think about the, I don't know how to pronounce, RISV, -R -R Risk 5? It seems like a good project. And I hope that they soon come up with a, a version that is good for a laptop like the one I use, and then I can get uh, someday a risk five laptop with nothing like the management engine backdoor and then use it well uh richard how about your time it's okay uh, to you uh, uh, or you you have to to go back to your work i better get back to my work okay but if we want to say if we want we can close with a little bit first of all people might know that there are some that have decided that i'm a monster and they sure. believe that i'm that i have a tremendous power and that uh, I must not be allowed to have this power. I've never come across this power in my life, but uh, they believe it's there. And uh, so they're, they ganged up to launch a campaign to try to drive me out of the Free Software Foundation and our whole community. And there's also, there are also a large number of people who disagree with them. And uh, there's a site where you can see uh, the my defense it's a site called stallmansupport.org and uh please take a look yeah i'm pretty sure you have a lot of people behind you uh richard uh, not as many as i need 
All right. So let's make an effort to spread the word. Well, I think your microphone is not working. Are you trying to say something? Oh, okay. oh sorry, sorry. It was mo muted. Uh, well, okay. unfortunately, uh, it's time to end this wonderful chat with Richard Storm. I'm very, I I'm very glad for for uh, for your presence, for your generosity. Uh, uh, I have to thank you again, and say I learned a lot here. Uh, I, I just don't learn English, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I learned a lot about movement, about your thinking, about uh, many, many, many problems we have to face from, from now on. And uh, I hope you everyone has enjoyed as uh, as much I did. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Kurecheu. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Oliva. Né? Uh, if, he, if, <coughs> if no one has not more to say, I, I'll... I'll I will. Go ahead. Me too. Right. I have something to say. So, go, <laughs> go ahead, go Kuchil. Go we, ahead. We, we appreciate your participation. And like we said, used to say in Brazil, the door is open. Yeah. So if you want to come here again, talk to us, if you enjoy... So I'm sure that audience, uh, uh, our audience, uh, enjoy the conversation, the talk, uh, even if n n uh, never always agree. Okay, I'd be happy to come back again, but you should ask me when you feel it would be good. Okay, I will ask. Thank you very much. <laughs> happy hacking. Happy hacking, sure. everybody. Thanks, Richard. I have Bye. to say, uh, Richard, I, I would like to thank you because uh, approximately 17 or 18 years ago, uh, I was initially very, very involved in software development. I was since like since my 12 years old, I was like a kind of a hacker kid uh, and really liked uh, tweaking and working with technology. And I had really this uh, excitement about technical things and to know how they work. But I didn't know about all of the things you 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 taught me. So w once I got in, in contact with your texts and the philosophy of the free software movement, I instantly got uh, in love and uh, with these ideas. And I understood that was something more uh, in addition to the to the technical uh, miracles of uh, technical things that the, the this appreciation that I had for technical things, I understood that was something even more important, uh, and that's because of your texts. Thank well, you. I'm glad my message got through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some people just don't see beyond the superficial levels. Uh, despite all the efforts I make to bring up those deeper issues. I think you're in good company because here in this room, all of us spread the news. Not so new. Well, happy hacking. I want to say goodbye and get back to other work. Thank you. Goodbye. Happy